He was the personification of infinity or eternity in the Ogdoad, in ancient Egyptian religion. His name originally meant flood, referring to the watery chaos that the Egyptians believed existed before the creation of the world. The Egyptians envisioned this chaos as infinite, in contrast with the finite created world, so He personified this aspect of the primordial waters. He's female counterpart was known as Hohe, which is simply the feminine form of his name. Like the other concepts in the Ogdoad, his male form was often depicted as a frog, or a frog-headed human, and his female form as a snake or snake-headed human. The frog head symbolized fertility, creation, and regeneration, and was also possessed by the other Ogdoad males Kek, Amun, and Nun. The other common representation depicts him crouching, holding a palm stem in each hand, or just one, sometimes with a palm stem in his hair, as palm stems represented long life to the Egyptians, the years being represented by notches on it. Depictions of this form also had a shin ring at the base of each palm stem, which represented infinity. Depictions of He were also used in hieroglyphs to represent one million which was essentially considered equivalent to infinity in ancient Egyptian mathematics. Thus this deity is also known as the god of millions of years. With his female counterpart Awet, he represented one of the four god-goddess pairs comprising the Ogdoad, a pantheon of eight primeval deities whose worship was centered at Hermopolis Magna. The mythology of the Ogdoad describes its eight members, He and Hehe, Nu and Nonet, Amun and Amunet, and Kuk and Kokot coming together in the cataclysmic event that gives rise to the sun and its deific personification, Adam. In ancient Egyptian numerology, gods such as He were used to represent numbers in a decimal point system. Particularly, the number one million is depicted in the hieroglyph of He, who is in his normal seated position. The personified, somewhat abstract god of eternity he possessed no known cult center or sanctuary, rather, his veneration revolved around symbolism and personal belief. The god's image and its iconographic elements reflected the wish for millions of years of life or rule. As such, the figure V finds frequent representation in amulets, prestige items, and royal iconography from the late Old Kingdom period onwards. He became associated with the king and his quest for longevity. For instance, he appears on the tomb of King Tutankhamun in two cartouches where he is crowned with a winged scarab beetle, symbolizing existence, and a sun disk. The placement of He in relation to King Tutankhamun's corpse means he will be granting him these millions of years into the afterlife. Hika was the deification of magic and medicine in ancient Egypt. The name is the Egyptian word for magic. According to Egyptian literature, Hika existed before duality had yet come into being. The term Hika was also used to refer to the practice of magical rituals. The Old Kingdom pyramid texts depict Hika as a supernatural energy that the gods possess. The cannibal pharaoh must devour other gods to gain this magical power. Eventually, Hika was elevated to a deity in his own right, and a cult devoted to him developed. By the time of the coffin texts, Hika is said to have been created at the beginning of time by the creator Adam. Later Hika is depicted as part of the tableau of the divine solar barge as a protector of Osiris capable of blinding crocodiles. Then, during the Ptolemaic dynasty, Hika's role was to proclaim the pharaoh's enthronement as a son of Isis, holding him in his arms. Other deities connected with the force of Hika include Hu, Sia, and Werethikau, whose name means she who has great magic. As Egyptologist Ogden Golod explains, magic in the Egyptian Book of the Dead is problematic. The text uses various words corresponding to magic, for the Egyptians thought magic was a legitimate belief. As Golod explains, Hika magic is many things, but, above all, it has a close association with speech and the power of the word. In the realm of Egyptian magic, actions did not necessarily speak louder than words they were often one and the same thing. Thought, deed, image, and power are theoretically united in the concept of Hika. Hecate is an Egyptian goddess of fertility, 
identified with Hathor, represented in the form of a frog. To the Egyptians, the frog was an ancient symbol of fertility, related to the annual flooding of the Nile. It has been proposed that her name is the origin of the name of Hecate, the Greek goddess of witchcraft. The beginning of her cult dates to the early dynastic period at least. Her name was part of the names of some highborn Second Dynasty individuals buried at Helwan, such as Prince Nisuhekit, and was mentioned on a stela of Wapemnifrit and in the pyramid texts. Early frog statuettes are often thought to be depictions of her. Hecate was considered the wife of Knum, who formed the bodies of new children on his potter's wheel. In the Osiris myth, it was Hecate who breathed life into the new body of Horus at birth, as she was a goddess of the last moments of birth. As the birth of Horus became more intimately associated with the resurrection of Osiris, so Hecate's role became one more closely associated with resurrection. Eventually, this association led to her amulets gaining the phrase I am the resurrection in the Christian era, along with cross and lamb symbolism. A temple dedicated to Horus and Hecate, dating to the Ptolemaic period, was found at Chus. As a fertility goddess, associated explicitly with the last stages of the flooding of the Nile, and so with the germination of corn, she became associated with the final stages of childbirth. This association, which appears to have arisen during the Middle Kingdom, gained her the title she who hastens the birth frog amulets representing Hecate were probably worn by women during childbirth to ensure an easy delivery. Horus, also known as Hor in ancient Egyptian, is one of the most significant ancient Egyptian deities who served many functions, most notably as god of kingship, healing, protection, the sun and the sky. He was worshipped from at least the late prehistoric Egypt until the Ptolemaic Kingdom and Roman Egypt. Different forms of Horus are recorded in history, and these are treated as distinct gods by Egyptologists. These various forms may be different manifestations of the same multilayered deity in which certain attributes or syncretic relationships are emphasized, not necessarily in opposition but complementary to one another, consistent with how the ancient Egyptians viewed the multiple facets of reality. He was most often depicted as a falcon, most likely a lanner falcon or peregrine falcon, or as a man with a falcon head. The pyramid texts 2400 to 2300 BCE, describe the nature of the pharaoh in different characters as both Horus and Osiris. The pharaoh as Horus in life became the pharaoh as Osiris in death, where he was united with the other gods. New incarnations of Horus succeeded the deceased pharaoh on earth in the form of new pharaohs. Since Horus was said to be the sky, he was considered to also contain the sun and moon. Egyptians believed that the sun was his right eye and the moon his left, and that they traversed the sky when he, a falcon, flew across it. Later, the reason that the moon was not as bright as the sun was explained by a tale, known as the contendings of Horus and Seth. In this tale, it was said that Set, the patron of Upper Egypt, and Horus, the patron of Lower Egypt, had battled for Egypt brutally, with neither side victorious, until eventually, the gods sided with Horus. As Horus was the ultimate victor he became known as Horus the Great, but more usually translated as Horus the Elder. In the struggle, Set had lost a testicle, and Horus' eye was gouged out. The Eye of Horus is an ancient Egyptian symbol of protection and royal power from deities, in this case from Horus or Are. The symbol is seen on images of Horus' mother, Isis, and on other deities associated with her. In the Egyptian language, the word for this symbol was Wedjat. It was the eye of one of the earliest Egyptian deities, Wadjet, who later became associated with Batet, Mut, and Hathor as well. Wadjet was a solar deity, and this symbol began as her all-seeing eye. In early artwork, Hathor is also depicted with this eye. Funerary amulets were often made in the shape of the eye of Horus. The Wedjat or eye of Horus is the central element of seven gold, faience, carnelian and lapis lazuli bracelets found on the mummy of Shoshank II. The Wedjat was intended to protect the king in the afterlife and to ward off evil. Egyptian and Near Eastern sailors would frequently paint the symbol on the bow of their vessel to ensure safe sea travel. Horus was told by his mother Isis, 
to protect the people of Egypt from Set, the god of the desert, who had killed Horus' father, Osiris. Horus had many battles with Set, not only to avenge his father, but to choose the rightful ruler of Egypt. In these battles, Horus came to be associated with Lower Egypt and became its patron. According to the contendings of Horus and Seth, Set is depicted as trying to prove his dominance by seducing Horus and then having sexual intercourse with him. However, Horus places his hand between his thighs and catches Set's semen, then subsequently throws it in the river so that he may not be said to have been inseminated by Set. Horus then deliberately spreads his semen on some lettuce, which was Set's favorite food. After Set had eaten the lettuce, they went to the gods to try to settle the argument over the rule of Egypt. The gods first listened to Set's claim of dominance over Horus, and call his semen forth, but it answered from the river, invalidating his claim. Then, the gods listened to Horus' claim of having dominated Set, and call his semen forth, and it answered from inside Set. Horus and Set divide the realm between them. This division can be equated with any of several fundamental dualities that the Egyptians saw in their world. Horus may receive the fertile lands around the Nile, the core of Egyptian civilization, in which case Set takes the barren desert or the foreign lands that are associated with it. Horus may rule the earth while Set dwells in the sky, and each god may take one of the two traditional halves of the country, Upper and Lower Egypt, in which case either god may be connected with either region. Yet in the Memphite theology, Geb, as judge, first apportions the realm between the claimants and then reverses himself awarding sole control to Horus. In this peaceable union, Horus and Set are reconciled, and the dualities that they represent have been resolved into a united whole. Through this resolution, the order is restored after the tumultuous conflict. Egyptologists have often tried to connect the conflict between the two gods with political events early in Egypt's history or prehistory. The cases in which the combatants divide the kingdom and the frequent association of the paired Horus and Set with the union of Upper and Lower Egypt, suggest that the two deities represent some kind of division within the country. Egyptian tradition and archaeological evidence indicate that Egypt was united at the beginning of its history when an Upper Egyptian kingdom, in the south, conquered Lower Egypt in the north. The Upper Egyptian rulers called themselves followers of Horus, and Horus became the tutelary deity of the unified polity and its kings. Yet Horus and Set cannot be easily equated with the two halves of the country. Both deities had several cult centers in each region, and Horus is often associated with Lower Egypt and Set with Upper Egypt. Other events may have also affected the myth. Before even Upper Egypt had a single ruler, two of its major cities were Nekan, in the far south, and Nagata, many miles to the north. The rulers of Nekan, where Horus was the patron deity, are generally believed to have unified Upper Egypt, including Negeta, under their sway. Set was associated with Negeta, so it is possible that the divine conflict dimly reflects an enmity between the cities in the distant past. Much later, at the end of the Second Dynasty 2890-2686 BCE, Pharaoh Seth Beribson used the Set animal to write his Serek name in place of the falcon hieroglyph representing Horus. His successor Kaskemwi used both Horus and Set in the writing of his Serek. This evidence has prompted conjecture that the Second Dynasty saw a clash between the followers of the Horus king and the worshippers of Set led by Seth Baribson. Kaskemwi's use of the two animal symbols would then represent the reconciliation of the two factions, as does the resolution of the myth.